You might have heard about the occurrence of multi-resistance infections that is now more and more widely spread in hospitals in, in particular, but also outside. So there are young people all of a sudden dying of having caught an infection and there's no way to treat these people. So this is a serious problem for our society and of course for the health of all humans. And so this multi-resistance is more and more abundant and at the same time there is less and less uh, new pharmaceuticals to treat these bacterial infections or fungal infections as well. So um, we are concerned about these problems as well as many other people and what have people done? They have looked in nature what kind of antibiotics are there and what they have found is peptides first in frogs and insects but now also in humans. They're called for example defensins to defend of course. And they're very important uh, for our health and uh, we try to understand how these peptides work and maybe find a better solution when compared to the common antibiotics that are used now that would develop less of resistance. So we are not the laboratory that's concerned with the microbiology and the medicine behind that but what we try to do is we try to understand how do these peptides, how do these compounds work and we know they work on membranes so the basically the exterior of all our cells that keeps the cells together and protects them from the environment and that's our specialty, the biophysics of these biomembranes. And so uh, we started uh, to study these peptides very early on. Uh, they were discovered already in the 1960s but people did not recognize their antibiotic effect or they might have recognized but they didn't recognize the utility. So there's very early publications that very few people know nowadays that describe these peptides but only in the late 1980s there were basically uh, two teams uh, that developed or that recognized these peptides are antibiotics and they found them either in insects or in frogs. So these two teams work on different systems and uh, these peptides are relatively short and they have something in common is they are very heavily charged. They have some hydrophobic amino acids that like to interact with the oily phase but they also carry a lot of positive charges that like to interact of course with negative surfaces for example. And there are let's say 20, 30 amino acids long, not very long for a peptide and people thought oh yeah that's good they might interact with these membranes. They did tests and they indeed they found that there is a, a change in structure. So they form helices separating nicely the hydrophobic part underneath and the charged residues on the top. And uh, so they could see that these helices make holes into membranes, they increase the permeability and all this is very interesting and what they thought of course they looked at the literature and they found uh, channels, membrane channels where all these helices would be aligned sort of transmembrane going through the membrane and interact one with the other and forming these holes. So that was the idea but there was very little data on that. So in 1990 about we started to look at them with biophysical methods and in particular solid state anomal for that purpose. It was sort of a period where we developed this technique and it was very interesting. So what we found then that was very surprising to us because we didn't expect that at all is that these peptides actually don't go through the membrane but they lay on the surface. And of course you might wonder how they can make holes then because you have these peptides but there is so much more of the membrane and why would water flow through and ions go through then? That uh, was a very puzzling question. And so we started to look at this problem in more detail using a variety of techniques like uh, CD, circular dichroism spectroscopy, infrared spectroscopy but mainly solid state NMR spectroscopy. And what we did for that purpose we actually uh, made supported bilayers of these membranes. So the, we deposited membranes on little surfaces and included these peptides and that's how we could see for example that they lie parallel to the surface and not transmembrane. But we can also look at the lipids of course and what we figured out that 
it's not just the peptide alone, but they have to sort of very closely include the lipids that surround them. So the lipids are actually not solid, right? They are a very soft material. It's like a gel, you can, or oily. And you, if you have these lipids, these membranes in your sample, you can smear it out. It's like a gel or something like that. So it's not, a, not liquid, not solid. So, but it's, it's soft enough to adapt, right? So you have this peptide here and the lipids, they can sort of form themselves around and adapt. But now look at this, you have the, the peptide here that sinks in halfway into the membrane, but not fully. And that means you have a lot of space underneath. And of course, this space doesn't stay empty and you have the lipids here left and right. And of course, then the lipids try to move in from both sides, right? And that causes the membrane actually to start bending. But of course it cannot, because there's another part of the membrane, it cannot bend forever. It has to sort of continue. But it's strained. The membrane isn't in equilibrium anymore. There is strain now on this membrane. And um, if there's only one peptide, it's fine. But if there's more and more of these peptides, disruptive little molecules that try to disturb the membrane packing, then it might rupture actually, and that's what we think it's happening. But it's against sort of the what people imagined initially. So it was it took a bit of time to also convince ourselves that's the way it works. And now we, we are pretty convinced it's the interaction with peptides and the lipids, the ensemble of the membrane has to be considered. And that's actually good because if you think about resistance, how does resistance occur in most or in most bacteria? You give this, you give a patient um, sort of an antibiotic, so you expose these pathogens to this antibiotic. And of course these antibiotics can then also uh, include mutations and change like a receptor molecule can change. And some of these receptors that have been mutated, that all of a sudden, they don't interact with the antibiotic anymore. So usually it's enough to just change one amino acid in a receptor too, to make this bacterium resistant. But you cannot do that to a membrane. The membrane is a very complex system. You cannot just change one thing and everything changes. The interaction of these peptides with the membrane is based on such varied channel mechanisms that uh, the induction of resistance is very hard for the bacteria. It's still possible, but it's much harder. So this bears great promise that we find if we, now that we understand a bit better how these things work, that we copied nature in a way to, uh, um, yeah, we, we basically copied nature and see how uh, things work and maybe do something that's easier to prepare, easier to apply to a patient, that we can find something that's not prone to resistance as fast and something very different from what's around now. So how can we use this knowledge now that these peptides lie flat on the surface and go, don't go transmembrane? Of course, the idea is now to develop small molecules that have also this a charged part and a an hydrophobic part that sinks in and the charged part is kept at the surface and the hydrophobic part sinks in and then the lipids are pushed apart and there is curvature strain. So there are several groups that uh, think about this concept and develop new molecules. There's a group in Japan, for example, they have designed very small compounds like uh, the size of usual medi medications that we take nowadays. But there's also other groups that just develop polymers that long, basically long chains of molecules that are rep repetitive. And some part of these polymers are positively charged and then there's the hydrophobic interaction. And this might, for example, be used to coat surfaces that have to be sterile because they also have antimicrobial activity. Then there's other groups that don't use peptides in a regular sense because a, a usual peptide can be digested in the stomach, but they replace the links between the amino acids that make up these peptides. And these links are stable also in the stomach, so it's peptide mimetics, we call them. And so all this is applications that have very promising future, I think, because they can be used to fight this problem of multi-resistance. And I think that's sort of the future of this. Of course, we want some treatment, 
for now most we always find one antibiotic only in a very in few cases we really desperate and don't find anything but it's it's getting more and more serious so at some point we need something completely new and now that we understand these peptides this gives us a chance to develop something that can replace these conventional antibiotics of course the peptides themselves might not be very useful to, for, as a medication because if you eat a peptide it's like eating meat or a proteins, right? They will be digested. But now we can, people started to develop small molecules on the same principles. They have a, a head with a positive charge and they have something hydrophobic underneath. So it will sink into the membranes, push the lipids apart, cause curvature and these things probably work pretty much in the same way as these peptides do. And they can be synthesized, they can be given orally and so on. We are very early on, it's just a dream right now. There are several startup companies that work on that. And uh, we don't do, we are using basic science, doing biophysics on these systems. But what we uh, and others of course have uh, found on these peptides will help to the development of these new compounds. And uh, I think that will be the future.